Let us all close our eyes. I want you just to become quiet before the Lord. Quiet in your heart, still your heart, still your minds. <sighs> Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord, with a hunger and a desire, Lord, and an eagerness and an expectation, Lord, that you speak to us, Lord, through the word, Father, that the word be spoken in truth and in authority, Lord. I resonate in our hearts, piercing hearts that have become hardened, Lord, softening hearts, Lord, Father. Make our hearts fertile, Lord. Let the seed be planted deep into our hearts this morning, Lord. Let us hear your voice, Lord. Let us hear your cries, Lord. Let us hear your desires, Lord. Let us hear your wants and your needs, Lord, from your people. Direct our paths, Lord, as we surrender all to you this morning, Lord. Every weight and every distraction, Lord, we set it aside now, Lord, and we become still before you. Let every wandering mind, every distracted mind, be submitted now and healed it to the Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me today. You have your way, Lord. Let your voice be heard in clarity, Lord. Clearly, Lord. Jesus, you are the head of this church. And we are the body, Lord. And as the head moves and directs, so the body shall follow. Have your way here in this place. Anoint my mouth, Lord. Let me not speak my own opinions and my own thoughts, Lord. But let me speak purely what you want. I heal to you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. I'm still saying this, one day we're just going to pray the whole service. I'm telling you, it's coming. <laughs> we do what the Lord wants, amen? Overriding everything that man puts in place, everything that man and every agenda of man, I've said it before, we abolish it, we allow the Holy Spirit to rule here, amen? So this morning, I have called my message, The Responsibility of the Calling. Responsibility of the calling. You can customize it if you want. You can make it your own and you can say the responsibility of my calling if you want to because each and every one of us are called. Just so you think, when people say, oh, but you're called to the ministry, they just have this vision in their mind that you're going to be preaching the gospel in front of a pulpit, in front of people. That's not what it means. The ministry is a body and we all form part of a body and the body all needs to function in order for it to function correctly. Every person needs in order to fulfill that task needs to operate in the call that God has on their life and Jesus said to us he gave us a commission and commandment to go out and to pray for the sick to preach the gospel lay hands on people he's tasked us with that he's given us I was speaking to somebody it was such an amazing discussion it started off with me intentionally just going there for 20 minutes three hours later I'm still talking to this person it was incredible um, it's a customer of mine and um we got speaking on the things of God, as one does, as the Holy Spirit does. And we got speaking about the book of Acts. And she just said to me, you know, she's just amazed by the book of Acts. She just can't take her eyes off it. She's just eating, devouring the book. She gets so spiritually excited. And I said to her, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit prompting me, I said to her, but yeah, you must understand that we are living in that church era. That was the formation, the start of the church. And I believe what's inside of you, what's getting excited, is the spirit inside is joying, being joyful, because that is how we should be living. And we read the story of the book of Acts and the accounts, what happened in the book of Acts, and how they, their shadows healed people, and how there was fire, and how there was tongues, and all that. It was amazing. That was the birth. That was the foundation of the church of Acts. That is the formation. That is what we should be experiencing. But then along comes man with his doctrine and all his agendas and structures, and he quenches that. That's why we're not experiencing and seeing those things happening in churches anymore. Because man will not allow those things to happen. And that's why I said to us, I believe that the Holy Spirit 
is getting so excited because he's pulling us back in that direction where we should be seeing and experiencing all that. The power and the authority that when we lay hands on people, it shouldn't be my responsibility to think, oh, is God going to heal them? God just says, go lay hands on them and they shall be healed. I should be walking in that. But I should be so full of faith that when I go lay hands on people, it's not my worry, it's not my concern. God will take care of that because he says that. But if we're not building on faith, if we're not spending time in the Word of God, we're not feeding on the things of faith, that I'm going to doubt when God asks me to do those things because now I'm starting to think, is this me or is this God? You see the difference? That is the difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the Spirit. When God commands, we just go. As the wind blows and as the wind moves, so we just heal it and off we go. We follow that. And that is what we've got to be. We've got to be those people. So really, if you can, now's the time. Spend in the time of the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts. Read that. I promise you the Spirit is going to become so happy and joyous. So I've called this message the responsibility of the calling. And as I was preparing, God reminded me of the time that I was called. And I've heard God's voice twice in my life. And it was literally, like I say, like he was standing right next to me. And I know people say, oh, but I hear the voice of God all the time. No, I've heard it twice, and it's clear. The first time was when he called me, when we were still very much living in the world. And it was in my way, in our bedroom early morning. And it was like a voice so clear that came from the door of my bedroom that I got up and I looked and I heard my name. He called my name. And I got up and I sat up and I looked at my wife and Pastor Jean was still sleeping. And I woke up and I said, did you just call me? And she said, no, I didn't. I was like, what is that about? Not knowing, afterwards realizing. So that was the time when he called me. And then there came the time when he called me into the ministry. And I was serving the Lord, doing the things that we do as Christians, going to church, not realizing what he had planned and installed for me. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. I can remember the exact point, the exact time. I was standing by my front door and I was about to take the keys off my key ring holder. And as I lifted up my hand, the words came to me and said to me, how serious are you? And I stopped and I was like, how serious am I what? To grab my keys? I didn't understand. And he asked me again, how serious and how committed are you? And I had no idea what that meant. I didn't understand it. It actually caught me off guard quite, quite a bit. I felt quite perturbed by that because I was a person, I still find myself as that. I classify myself as somebody who's loyal and someone who's serious and committed. But you are be asked that question, how serious and how committed are you? Thinking about it now, I understand why he asked me those questions of where he had me and needed me to go. I didn't have the understanding of what he was referring to. See, God had a plan for me, and I wasn't aware of the extent. I wasn't aware of the path. I wasn't aware of the weight of the calling that was in store for me. I had no idea. This was not part of my plan. I'll tell you what. Being in front of people, standing here, preaching the gospel, being a pastor, if you ask, ask Pastor Jean, she would tell you I was not part of my plan. But that's why I said it's not our plan, it's his plan. But he asked me that question that very day, how serious are you? Because he wanted to know if I could be trusted and if I would be serious or not with what he was planning on giving me. Hmm. You see, our time of salvation is an amazing, glorious time. And at that point, when he asked me that question, I had received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. For the first time in my life, I had found fulfillment in Christ. Every single question that I had had been answered. That longing, that void, everything it filled. I found him. I was complete fulfillment in Christ. And the time of salvation is an amazing, glorious time. But it's when you receive the revelation of that it's not just about that Jesus died on the cross for us, that we have a, have a destiny and eternity with him in heaven. It's not only about that, but it's about having that revelation that he has a call and a plan for each and every one of us. Each and every one of you have been called by name. 
with a purpose and an intention. And we always have this thing like, oh, but Lord, I don't have the ability. Great, you don't have the ability, but God will work with you. He will work with you if you are healed and submitted. But the question would be asked first, how serious are you? How committed are you? Because the times are going to come, the difficulties are going to come, there's going to be more valleys than there are going to be hills and mountains. How serious are you that when those challenges come your way, that you are still going to be standing and you're still going to be doing what I've called you to do? Or when it doesn't get tough, are you going to throw in the towel and walk away? And he'll come and he'll test you. He will test you in those times. He doesn't just lay it out on a silver platter for you and say, well, yeah, my child, here's the calling I have for you. Take it and off you go. He will test you in those areas first. Because why? Because he wants to see your motive. Because testing purifies your motives. If there's anything that is not of him, him, he will test you in that area because he wants to purify whatever's not of him there. Because in order for you to bear fruit, in order for you to carry that weight that he's called you, he wants to make sure that you are able. But you see, the thing is, it starts with the question, are you willing? Are you willing? Hmm. And he wanted to know from me, am I prepared for the responsibility of the calling? Hmm. Okay, so let's get to the scripture. We're going to look at 1 Kings today. 1 Kings chapter 19. You can go there if you have your Bibles. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to be reading from verse 15, but I want to just paint the picture for you before we start. We're going to be reading about Prophet Elijah and Elisha, great men of God, great things of God. And we see a Prophet Elijah, amazing man, where he first appears on the, on the scene where he goes up to King Ahab. Now, King Ahab was a horrible, detestable man. He did bad things in the sight of God, and he had a wife named Jezebel. And they did terrible things persecuting believers and Christians, crucifying prophets of God, horrible, horrible, detestable things. And we find ourselves Elijah, where we see this, the scripture, Elijah running away and fleeing from Jezebel. Then we see Elijah coming back, coming back to Ahab, and he actually then sets a test, and he says to King Ahab, you bring your prophets, your prophets of Baal, bring them because they had brought in the Baal worship of Baal at that stage and all the Israelites and people have turned away from God and Elijah said ah oh, what we'll do is we'll have a, a showdown <laughs> we'll have a showdown what we'll do is you bring your prophets and I'll stand there we're going to build an altar out of wood we're going to take an oxen we're going to slay an ox and put the meat on the wood and then we're going to pray and we're going to call on your God and I'll call on my God and the God that sends fire down from heaven and ignites the altar and burns up the meat, that will be the God that we serve. And the people all agreed, yes, that would be the God that we serve. So then we see the prophets of Baal going first and they're praying and they're cutting themselves and Elijah actually goes forth and actually makes fun of them. He mocks them. He does. Because he knew who his God was. And he mocks them and they try and they try and eventually Elijah takes over and he says, now it's my turn. And what he actually goes in one step further and even makes it a little bit even harder he goes and gets him to make a, a, like a funnel around the altar, to dig a funnel around, to fill it up with water, pouring water over the altar. And we know for those people that like to bride, the last thing you want on your wood is water. And then Elijah prays to his God, and God sends down fire and ignites the altar, and all the people turn and say, we'll serve the Lord, because he is the true and one and only God. And then we see again that Elijah fleeing once again, fleeing from because Jezebel was so angry that she wanted to kill him. And what's amazing me is you read the story, you see God sending down fire, this amazing man of God, seeing these miracles take place, but yet he ran from a woman? A woman don't get any ideas. And he flees for his life and he runs and he ends up in a cave. Now go read the account of that when he's in the cave. And it says there that God sent wind thunder 
It said that God wasn't in the thunder. And it said that God sent rain. And it said that God wasn't in the rain. It said God sent fire, but God wasn't in the fire. God was in the quietness. That's a beautiful scripture. Go read that. Because so many times we're looking for God in the loud, in the, you know what I mean? But God is in the quiet. And that's why it's so important for us to become quiet before the Lord, get into the quiet place, because it's in the stillness where he speaks to you. And the beautiful thing is he doesn't, he doesn't mess around. He just says to Elijah, what are you doing? What are you doing? In other words, what are you doing here? So anyway, then he calls him out, and we're going to pick up now in chapter 19, verse 15, we're going to see where God calls him out. Because remember now, Elijah had an assignment. He had a responsibility to go and do the things of the Lord. And yeah, he was hiding from a woman in a cave because he was scared. So God said, what are you doing? Get out of the cave. Okay? And yeah, we pick up the story in chapter 15. It says, then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshah, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mechola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So here we see God calling Elijah out of the cave, get out of there, and giving him specific instructions and telling him to go anoint these people of kings. And he also then says, go and anoint and find Elisha and anoint him as the prophet. Because he's going to take over from you. Okay, we see that in the scripture. Yes. Now let's turn to verse 19. After Elisha gets the stern taunting, talking to from God, I can imagine he probably realized I better pull myself together and I better go and do what he's asked me to do. So off he goes. It says, verse 19, So he departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelfth. So what that literally means is he had the twelve oxen, he had the ten in front of him, the twelve, the two of them were sitting next to him, and he was standing plowing with them. Okay? And this is an amazing part of the scripture. It says, Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Now there's no... Anywhere else in that story does it say that Elijah said anything to him? That Elijah said, sorry, I just need to talk to you about something before you carry on doing what you do. He literally says he walked past him and he threw his mantle on him. Now his mantle was his cloak, his coat. So he took his coat off, he threw his coat onto Elisha and it said that he carried on walking past. Don't you find that a bit strange? I did. I saw the humor in that. I'm like, imagine if someone's walking past me, just takes his cloak off and throws it on me and just carries on walking. I'd be like, what on earth is this? What is this about? But we understand that Elisha, being a man of God, I would understand that God was possibly speaking to him before that time happened. He knew it. He would possibly have been asked, how serious are you? How committed are you? All of those questions that were posed to me, I'm sure we exactly were faced to Elisha. How serious are you? He was tested prior. Okay, so we get this. Elijah taking his mantle, his cloak, throwing it off. And the uh, cloak, was, which was representative of the anointing, the anointing was the cloak, and he threw it on Elisha, and he carried on walking. So in other words, with his actions, without saying anything, he says that my God has chosen you to take over from me. You are the chosen one that God has spoken of. Now we're going to pick up from verse 20. This is where it gets interesting. 1 Kings 19 verse 20. I am reading out the New King James, but you're more than welcome to follow in your Bible if you want to. 1 Kings 19 verse 20, it says, And then he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. So this comes after Elijah took off the cloak, threw it on Elisha, carried on walking. Yeah? Didn't stop to say anything. He just kept on walking. Kept on walking. Elisha stopped what he was doing, ran after the man of God, and he said these words. He said, please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Hmm. So we see this, what he's saying here. In other words, he's saying, I'm prepared to come with you. I'm prepared to follow you, but I just want to go and just kiss my mom and my dad first. And then we get this harsh reaction from Elijah saying, go back again for what have I done to you? Wow. So we read this verse in the scripture and we think, but hang on a minute. 
This request from Elisha seemed pretty reasonable, wouldn't you think? Hmm? Uh, come on, let's be honest. If someone came and said to you, or didn't even say anything, just came and threw their cloak on you, which meant come and follow me, and you just say, well, let me just go say goodbye to my wife and my children first, but now we'll follow you. And Elijah then said to him, but what have I done to you? Go back. Harsh reality. See, but Elisha's reaction speaks differently to that. Because he was saying, what have I done? In other words, have I made a mistake? In choosing you. You see, family, nothing can be more important than the call of God on your lives. Nothing. And it's gone very quiet. Because it comes at a price, it comes at a cost. Trust me. And the thing is that when we accept the responsibility of that calling, the anointing will come. But he will ask you the question first. He will test your motives first. And when you submit and yield to that and surrender all to him, the anointing will come for that office or for that responsibility that he's called you. See, God will not give us the anointing if we're not prepared to carry out the assignment. If I'm not prepared or if, he's, if the person's not prepared to do what God's asked of him, he will not give us the anointing to do that what he's asked of us, correct? If you are not willing, if you are not willing to lay it all down, if you are not willing to be completely surrendered, he will not give it all to you. Hmm. See, God wasn't going to give the anointing to Elisha if he wasn't completely sold out and committed. And thinking back now to my encounter when the Lord asked me, how serious am I, am I? See, he was checking my motives and my heart. He was wanting to know that when things get really tough and challenging, are you still going to be committed and are you still going to be serious? And trust me, there are times when things have been tough and times have been hard where I've actually thought about, you know what, no, I don't think I can do this. But then I'm reminded of the question that he asked me, how serious are you? And that stands out so strong. Because if I had a fear of man and not a fear of God, I would have thrown in a towel a long time ago. That if we walk with the fear of God, that when God calls you by name, and he lays that task, that responsibility on you, he trusts you with it. It's a whole different level, family. And I always say this, and I mentioned this in my last message, how sad a day it will be that if when we get to heaven one day and we get up there, and the Lord opens up the book and he shows us everything that not only what we've done, but what we haven't done. Every plan that he had for us, every area that he wanted us to go and we wouldn't go. I think that's going to be a sad day for many people. Because we will see that he had everything laid out and you might not even realize that, Lord, I didn't know that you had this plan for me. And we worry about these 70 to 80 years on life and we're concerned about that. How long is eternity? Eternity is a very long time. Now, you see, when we surrender our plan and our will to the Lord, the power of God will come on you. And you will see God move mightily through you, mightily through you, doing amazing things. But he'll test you first. He'll test you first. You might see yourself as an evangelist, speaking to thousands of people, evangelizing. But yet when he places a person in front of you, a work colleague, a, a family member, he's testing your motives, testing your heart, testing your commitment. Can he trust you with little before he trusts you with much? And that goes for tithing too. Sorry, I'm going down this road. And I know that some of you might get angry with me. But we want to be blessed. Lord, bless me that I can be a blessing to others. But yet we can't be trusted with our tithe. He will always ask you the difficult questions first, which requires of me to do. He's checking your motives. He's checking your heart. You say you trust me. Do you really trust me? It's easy to trust when you have everything. 
But when you have nothing, then who do you trust? Because we find our value, we find trust in, in, in assets, in things that we have. But when those things are taken away, think of the life of Job. That was taken away. Everything that he had was taken away, and yet he still served the Lord. Family, it's all about his plans. It's not about what we want to do. It's not about whatever we will do and want to do. It's about what he wants to do through us. It's a different. It's totally different, trust me. It is a daily reminder, Lord, not thy will, not my will, but thy will, Lord. Daily, Lord, not my will. What it is that you want from me, Lord. A laying down, a laying down of self, a laying down of own desires and own wants. Because those wants and desires are there. They are there. But it's a laying down, Lord, whatever it is, I will, I will follow you regardless, and I will do what you want me to do. Ephesians 2 verse 10. Ephesians 2 verse 10 in the New International Version, it says, yeah, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Say good works. Which God prepared in advance for us to do. Say this, I am God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for me to do. Hmm. God's handiwork, created in his likeness and his image, bought with a price. To do good works. So before time began, God had prepared and He's given us a plan long before we were even thought of. That plan was put into fruition. He's called us by name. Each of us have got a specific assignment, a specific plan, a specific purpose. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5b. 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 5, part B says, As the Lord has assigned to each his task. As the Lord has assigned to each his task. You get that? We have a responsibility, each and every one of us. A specific assignment. Don't ever get to the point where we start comparing one against the other because he's called you for a specific assignment and a specific task individually. Are you prepared to carry that responsibility or not? Assurance of salvation is not all what it is about being as a Christian family. It's about understanding that we've been called by name with a task, that we have a revelation that he has a purpose and a plan for our lives. And am I living that purpose and that plan to fruition or am I letting it just Go to waste. And that purpose comes with great responsibility. Trust me. Great weight. Great responsibility. And the thing is, if we're not going to be prepared to carry that responsibility, God will find somebody else. That is the sad reality. Because God's plans will always come to pass. And just because he's called you and you turn around and say, oh no, this is too much for me, he will find somebody else to fulfill that. Because it needs to come to pass. Those people need to be reached. Those things need to be done. And like I said, in heaven there's going to be a sad day when people get there and realize, oh, this is what you had planned for me and I didn't even see it. I walked away from it. I turned my head from it. Because the things of this world were more important to what that you wanted from me, Lord. I was chasing off the riches. I was chasing off the accolades. I was chasing off the man's approval. For what? What does it account for? Nothing. Nothing. But filthy rags. We need to change our focus and change our look and start looking at the things of God and what is pleasing to Him. So let us conclude and let us look at 1 Kings 19 verse 21. 
after Elijah said these words to Elisha, we see Elisha now in verse 21 saying, so Elisha turned back from him after Elijah said these very harsh words to him, what have I done, go back. He turned back from him and he took a yoke of oxen, he slaughtered them, he boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and he gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Key word there, became his servant. He didn't turn around and say, okay, well, now that I've got the anointing, I've got the office, I'm going to be in charge now. He became his servant. He submitted under authority. God will not give you authority. He will not trust you with authority until you are able to submit to authority. Do you see this? Warning. What did Elijah do in his actions? Elisha went and burnt everything of his past. He said, that's not going to be a distraction for me. I will show you, Elijah, I will show you, God, that what you said and how you chose me, I am the right person. I'm going to go and burn everything that might distract me, that might take my attention and my focus away from what you've called me, because that is more important than what is behind me. And he went and burnt it all. Burning it all, signifying that I want nothing to do with that. Elisha knew that in order for him to receive the anointing that he first needed to submit to Elijah's authority. God will test you. Are you keen? Are you able? Some of you have struggles and difficulty submitting with authority and saying, but oh, you don't know. I find it hard. That's not biblical. Biblical way is submitting under authority, I'm just saying. So if you find it hard to be submitted under authority, it's not godly. There's authority. Biblically, it speaks about it over and over and over again. If you want to be blessed, if you want to walk in authority, we've got to submit under authority. If you find yourself challenged by authority, find yourself kicking up against authority, it's rebellion. No other word. It's rebellion. It's rebellion. Let's just call it what it is. See, Elisha was prepared to pay the price in order to carry the anointing that God had in store for him. And yeah, we see a very similar event. Hang in there, I'm nearly done. We see a very similar event happening many years after this. Jesus comes along in the book of Luke. And he comes along many years after this transpired. And he says something very similar to what the words of Elijah said to Elisha. We see it in Luke 9, verse 59. In the New Living Translation, he said to another person, this is Jesus speaking, come follow me. Come follow me. To which the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. Once again, you think to yourself, but that seems like a pretty reasonable request. And Jesus replies, not just anybody. Jesus replies, he says, Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own. Wow. Your duty is to go and preach the kingdom of God. Another person said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. Once again, he would think a reasonable request, would you not? To which Jesus then said to him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Ouch. <clears throat> Yeah, we find this person preparing to put his hand to the plow, preparing to do what God has asked him to do, but to look behind him, which is a distraction. And Jesus very clearly says that he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Harsh words, but reality. If we think about Lot's wife, what happened to her? Pillow of salt, do you recall? Because while she was yearning and looking behind her for the things that she was leaving behind. Family, this is all biblical. It's not just a futuristic animated story. These are events that's happened. God's warning us. He's speaking to us through the word. We either heed his instruction, we either heed his warning, and we live accordingly or we don't. But don't expect God's favor and blessing if you are not living the way that God's asked you to live. You cannot. We serve a God that's all in, all in or nothing. You can't live one foot here, one foot there, whatever pleases you. It doesn't work like that, family. It's all in or nothing. Does he have your whole heart? Yes or no? 
Are you prepared to carry the responsibility? Yes or no? And don't say, oh yeah, but I'm not called in the ministry. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And I know this is probably hard and probably challenging for a lot of you, but as well as it's challenging and hard for me. I'm no different. No different. Somebody who wanted nothing to do with the, with, with the ministry. Nothing. I had a wife that wanted to go to Bible college. That's all I knew. That's all I wanted. But God had other plans. God had other plans. He's got plans for you. Plans for you. Amazing, perfect plans. Plans to prosper you. Come on now. But yet we've got our heads so focused and looking behind us over what we're leaving behind that's more important. Nothing is more important than what God has called you and planned for you. Nothing. Nothing. Don't be deceived because that's Satan's territory. He wants you to look behind. He wants you to look at your past. He wants to look what you're leaving behind and see it as a loss. It is not. It is but gain. Look to the things. What God has in store for you, family. Walking that, I promise you, when you walk out in that and you prepare to take that responsibility and you carry that, there's such fulfillment, there's such peace. Is it easy? No. It is not. But you know who you're doing it for. You're not doing it for pleasing of man. You're doing it because God had called you by name. He had a plan for you. A specific plan for you. A specific assignment for you. But he's asking each and every one of you, are you prepared to carry the responsibility? And you don't have to say yes, family. That's the beauty of the God that we serve. He doesn't say you have to say yes. It's fine. If you don't want to say yes, it's up to you. But he will find somebody to fulfill that task. And you're going to get to heaven one day and you're going to see that book open and he's going to have that plan laid out for you and you are going to be flabbergasted. Lord, is this what you had in plan in store for me? Yes, my child. But you didn't want it. I asked you the question and you didn't want it. But I still love you. Oh, I still love you. But you didn't want it. I gave it to somebody else. What a sad day that'll be. What a sad day that'll be. Talk about living with regret. Talk about living with what ifs. What if I take what is asked of me now and do what is asked of me now? What if? What if, Lord, I take that now and I walk in that responsibility, no matter how difficult it is, but Lord, you called me by name. That if you've asked me, you've called me, you've anointed me. You've anointed me. You've given me every ability that there is to do what you've asked of me to do. I'm not doing this on my own strength. And he will not expect of you to do it in your own strength either. The anointing is there. It comes with the responsibility. But are you prepared to carry that responsibility or not? Amen. Let's close our eyes. I know this message has been sobering. But we don't come to church to hear a, a message preached that tickles our ears. We don't come to church to hear a message saying how great thou art. We come to church to hear what the Word of God says. We come to church to receive the message that God has for each and every one of us. I'm here to tell you that God has called each and every one of you by name. That he knew you before you were formed. It says that he knew the number of hairs on our heads. He knew everything about us. We've been created in his likeness and his image. Wow, what a revelation that is. And some people say, oh, but you weren't planned or you were a mistake. Oh, really? I've been created in the image and likeness of Christ. Wow. Let that sit in your spirit today. But the thing is, 
how we live this life is entirely up to us each and every one of us individually what you do with the gift that God's given you is up to you how you steward that we all want to hear the words well done good and faithful servant good and faithful have you been faithful for what he's given you have you been seen trustworthy can he trust you with much don't look at the little now don't look at the little things but Lord I'm only doing mundane things now no 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 he's checking your heart motives he's purifying your heart motives and if there's any distractions that are taking your focus off your calling he will disrupt them I promise you now and if you turn around and say Lord here I am I'm ready Lord use me Lord and any distraction comes your way he will disrupt that distraction he will remove it from you because he wants you to be focused and intentional he will be with you the whole way it is not a walk that you go alone that there will be times yes where it does seem lonely and it does seem quiet but he calls us to the places that many refuse and don't want to go and many of you are called to go to those places and he's trusting you with that I always tell people start at home first before you go and preach to the thousands and the masses how do you treat your wife how do you treat your children how do you treat your family members start at home first because God's watching you he's looking at you how do you how do you handle your finances are you a good steward with your finances how can the Lord give you millions how can he trust you with huge finances if he can't trust you with a little that's biblical family trust me I had to learn it the same way we all go through the same lessons the same purifying the same testing but when you surrender it all say Lord here I am I don't have much Lord but have my heart Lord have every desire and you can honestly say I mean honestly say Lord not my will but thy will be done it's a bold declaration it's a bold statement and we pray these things sometimes we're not thinking about it but think about that we pray not my will meaning not my desires not my intentions not my things that please me but your will Lord. and many a times his will consists of things that are uncomfortable for the flesh that are difficult for the flesh but in doing them you're walking in the perfect calling that he has for your life and you carry that responsibility of the calling Lord I pray right now for each and every person Lord that's heard this message Father God that there be new revelations understanding Lord give us all wisdom Lord the word says that he that desires wisdom when he asks shall receive that you give us wisdom Lord wisdom is the application of the things that we hear and know that as the word that is planted in our hearts that we apply those things that we walk these things out Lord because it's in the doing Lord we're not hearers only but we are doers Lord of everything that you have asked of us Lord that you've told us to go and make disciples Lord preaching the gospel laying hands on the sick that we shall do that Lord because you've tossed us that's us to do let us start off by speaking just to the people in our close vicinity Lord speaking of your goodness testifying of your greatness Lord speaking Jesus wherever we go planting seeds planting seeds wherever we go Lord souls Lord souls 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 for the kingdom thank you Lord that you give us a new desire and a hunger Lord to be in your presence and time in the word 
Thank you for new oil that's pouring out, Lord. Thank you for new fires that are burning and reigniting, Lord, I pray. Lord, I plead the blood over each and every person here, Father. Plead the blood over their homes, Lord, over their possessions, Lord, over their cars as they travel home, Lord. Keep them safe. Bring them back again next week, Father. But let this word be planted deep into their spirits today, I pray. Give them a revelation understanding, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen, everybody.